Good evening, and welcome to St. Luke's and our house of worship this evening. Tonight, our theme is the Christian trusts God to provide and to take care of all of our needs, especially our needs of being connected to him. Tonight, we'll follow the order of morning praise. Just a note that when we get to the Venite, the come, O come, the congregation is invited to sing the refrain and the verses. So the whole thing, we will sing that together. We begin worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please stand. <clears throat> o Lord, open my lips, my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Come, oh, come, let us worship. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. You are a great and a wondrous God, copying in your hands all the depths of earth. You made the hills and the mountains high. You made the hill and the dry land. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. Come, let us worship and bowing low. Kneel before the one who has made us all. You are the God whom we call our own. We are the flock that you shepherd. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our first lesson this morning is from Isaiah chapter 55, and we hear the Lord's invitation to partake of his salvation freely, without cost. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. The word of our Lord. Alleluia! Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Alleluia! We'll continue with our gospel lesson. I'd invite you to please stand for the reading of the gospel. Jesus provides for all of our needs. We're reminded of that in the tax collector Matthew's account of the feeding of the 5,000. Matthew chapter 14, we begin with verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. 
When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue with our hymn of the day this evening. Please be seated. sermon text for this evening is Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What, then, shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of our Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Tonight before us, in these verses from Romans, we have a high point, a pinnacle of your love and your compassion for us, that you have made yourself inseparable from us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you help us to appreciate this mystery and to love you as you have loved us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, in our sermons the past several weeks, we've been working through the book of Romans one word at a time. One key concept from each section at a time. Last Sunday, Pastor Redfield shared with us a message about how we have been chosen. In his mercy, God chose us even before we could do anything good or bad, even before we could show that we were worth it or not worth it. In his love and his compassion, he predestined us. Then he called us through the gospel. Then he declared us not guilty. And then he glorifies us. Even now, even though it's hidden right now, he has begun to glorify us, and one day that glory will become clear to all when Jesus returns and brings us to himself. If all of this wasn't enough, in the verses that we're looking at tonight, the Apostle Paul, speaking the inspired word of God, says that we are inseparable. That God has not only chosen us, but there is nothing in all creation that will separate us from his love. Do you believe this? Do you believe that nothing will separate you from Christ's love? Look at what Paul says in verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. Not death, not life, not angels, nor demons, not the present or the future, nor any powers, no height or depth, nothing in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But sometimes that's hard to believe, isn't it? And maybe that's why Paul lists the things that he does here, because all of these things certainly seem like they could separate us from the love of God. Of Christ. Just take that first one. Death. If there's anything that seems like it could separate us from God, it would be death. Death is the great unknown. None of us here has ever experienced death. We don't know what it feels like. We really don't know what happens to our consciousness When we die, when our heart stops beating and those neurons stop firing in our brains, 
wouldn't that separate us from God? If our life is gone, won't we be separated from the author of life? Paul says no. What about life? How could life separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? I guess it's been over a month now since our 15 confirmads, young men and women, stood before the congregation and confessed their faith in Jesus. And on that day, were so happy that they confessed that they believed the faith into which they were baptized. But we also pray, don't we? We pray because we know that they have a long road ahead of them. They have a life in front of them. And we know how hard Satan works to attack that faith and to lead them astray. Because we know how hard he works on us throughout our life. There's a story of a couple who came into the pastor's office because they were having marriage problems. They just couldn't stop arguing and bickering and backbiting and attacking each other. And finally, when the wife indicated that she was pretty much ready to give up on this marriage, the husband said, you can't give up. I would die for you. And the pastor said, well, if you die for her, why don't you live for her? The point is, sometimes it's actually easier to die because it's over in a moment than to live every waking moment for someone. Sometimes life, waking up day after day, continually living your faith, is actually harder than dying for your faith. Paul says, what if life separates you from Christ? Then he goes on. What about these invisible powers, angels and demons working behind the scenes? Now, in our modern world, we don't think about this a whole lot. We like to pretend that these things don't exist and we're, we're too scientific for that. But at other times in history and in other cultures, they were acutely aware of the forces behind everything. And the angels and the demons are in a battle for our soul. What if some supernatural power, like a demon, tears me away from the love of Christ? Could that happen? Again, Paul says, no. What about powers? The powers that are working in this world. Now this could be referring to a lot of different things. It could still be referring to those supernatural powers in the heavens, but it could also be referring to political powers and authorities. What if the government tries to tear me away from Christ? Well, we've seen those powers at work recently, haven't we? If the coronavirus was not bad enough, the powers have used this virus and they've used information to divide people. I've seen it tear families apart because the powers are working to twist the facts and to lead people to think that if someone has a different opinion, you should hate them. Could the powers tear us away from the love of Christ? Again, all of these things are real threats. What about something in the highest heavens or the deepest depths or anything else in creation? Chronic pain, heartache, loneliness, fear, worry. Could any of these things separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It certainly seems like it, doesn't it? And I think we could all say that if it depended on us, 
if it depended on our strength or our wisdom or our moral fortitude to not fall into sin, we'd all be in big trouble. If being inseparable depended on us, I don't know how inseparable that would be. But look at what God says. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He doesn't say that you're more than conquerors because you're strong enough or you're smart enough or you're good enough. He says you're more than conquerors through him who loved us. The power all comes from God. And he's the one who makes us inseparable. In fact, this word more than conquerors that I have underlined there, in the Greek it's one word that could literally be, literally be translated super conquerors. You are overwhelmingly victorious through him who loved you. It's not like we just snuck by and got a last second victory by one or two points. It's like a rout, like a shutout. That even though it may look like we're losing here on earth, through the love of God and Christ Jesus, we are more than conquerors. Paul asks, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If God is for us, God for us. Some have said this is a perfect three-word summary of the plan of salvation. God for you. And if you know that, you know that God loves you. If God, the creator of the universe, if God, the one who created all things and who says that he's going to judge all things, is for you, how could he possibly let anything that he created or controlled tear you away from him? If God is on your side, you have nothing to fear. Not only this, but it says, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not give us everything along with him? We could use a human example here. Imagine for a moment that there's a couple looking to adopt a child. They desperately want to adopt a little baby and take her home into their family. But they don't have the funds. They just don't have the resources to do it. So they sell their beautiful house in the suburbs and buy a fixer-upper on the bad side of town. They work extra hours. They drive cars that are 10, 20 years old and even cancel all of their subscriptions. Netflix, internet, Hulu, all of it, because they're trying to save up money for this child. And finally, after about five or ten years, they have enough money to adopt a little baby. Now, when they bring that little girl home, do you think they'll neglect her? Do you think they'll just put her on the couch with a bowl of Fruit Loops and let her watch TV all day? Or do you think they'll love her and continue to provide for her? If God did not spare what was most precious to him, if he did not spare his one and only son so that you could be with him forever, how will he not work all things to continue to love you and forgive you? Now, 
Paul kind of anticipates another objection here. He sees someone saying, okay, that's great. God didn't spare his own son for me and he's controlling all of creation to bring me home to him. But what if my own sin separates me from God? What if God condemns me? The Bible's pretty clear that just one sin is enough to separate sinners from a holy God. So what if my own weaknesses, my own failures, what if one of those terrible things that I've done in the past is brought out at the last minute and it condemns me? What if God looks into my heart, and he does, and he sees all of the greed and the lust and the anger and the lack of forgiveness? What if that separates me from God's love? Verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Now, you might think that God should condemn you for your sin. That this should separate you from his love. And your conscience may scream out against you night and day. But guess what? Thankfully, you don't get to judge yourself. It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns. How can God justify? Again, because of his son, Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. God didn't just forget about our sin. He put it on his son, Jesus Christ, who died and it was all buried with him. And then he, he rises again on the third day to prove that it's all been taken away. Not only that, Jesus ascended into heaven and he's God's right-hand man. And he intercedes for us. So when you think your sin is too much, Jesus says to the Father, you can't condemn them because you condemned that sin in me. When you think your guilt is too much, you have an advocate, a lawyer, right there with the Father saying, all the guilt's been taken away, interceding for you. Inseparable. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, your Lord. This is why Paul can say, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? What's interesting is that when Paul wrote these words, he had already experienced the first six things that he lists here. He had experienced trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, shipwrecks where he's left naked, danger. This was his life. Tradition has it that not too long after this, he would experience the seventh, the sword where he would be taken outside the city gate of Rome, just like his Savior Jesus, and the sword would come down on the back of his neck and behead him. But not even that. Even though it seemed like the sword separated him from Christ, it actually drew him closer than ever to his Savior who died a similar martyr death. Because Paul knew that nothing in all creation, not even a sword, could separate him from the love of God in Christ. Inseparable. We are more than conquerors. And that's not just something in the future. It's not like we just all have to wait until we die and then we'll find out that we're conquerors. 
Paul uses a present tense here. Right now, you are more than conquerors. Right now, even if it doesn't look like it, even when a friend or a coworker mocks and ridicules you for following Christ and supposedly wasting all of your time and money on this, you are more than a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror, even when you sometimes feel confused, even when you sometimes feel like you're groveling in the same sins again and again. You're more than a conqueror through God who's loved you in Christ. You're more than a conqueror. Even when the cancer doesn't go away, and even when your body grows more and more frail and begins to wear out, you're more than a conqueror because you are inseparable. You're inseparable from your God because God is for us. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God that transcends all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father This is the time where we would usually gather our offerings. There's a basket in the back, and you can also send your offerings in in the other ways as well. We thank you for your continued support of the ministry here at St. Luke's. We'll continue with our prayer of the church. And in our special prayers today, we offer a prayer of thanks for Isaiah Grunholtz and Nicole Tutai who will be married, God willing, on August 21st at St. John's Wauwatosa. We say a prayer of thanks for Gladys Pillsbury, who's celebrating her 97th birthday. We also offer up a prayer for the baptism of the little Horebsky baby, who, God willing, will be baptized at the 915 service on Sunday. A prayer of thanksgiving for Scott and Gina Wiedenhaft in 32 years of marriage and a prayer of comfort for the family of Jackie Utek, which would be Nate's wife, daughter-in-law of Rod and Ruth, who was recently taken home to heaven. Please stand for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promises of salvation in your Son, Jesus Christ, and especially the comfort that nothing in heaven or earth can separate us from your love. Help us to understand and appreciate that when we are weak, you are strong, and where we fail, you forgive. Dear Jesus, we thank you for the gift of marriage and pray that you be with Isaiah and Nicole as they enter this sacred bond. Help them to love each other as you have loved them and to have the kind of commitment that comes from your forgiveness. We also thank you for being the bond that has held together the marriage of Scott and Gina for 32 years. Help them to continue to grow in their love for you and for each other all the days of their lives. We also thank you for the many years of life that you have given Gladys. Continue to be her rock and her refuge. Help her to rely on you and to be a blessing to others as you have been a blessing to her. We thank you for your covenant promises through water and the word 
which will be poured out on the little Horovsky baby. Strengthen him, use his parents to nurture and keep him safe until life everlasting. Finally, Lord, we ask that you be with the UTEC family and especially Nate in this time of earthly loss. We confess that your thoughts are not our thoughts and your ways are not our ways, yet we know that you promise to work all things, even when we cannot understand them, for the good of your children. Comfort the family with your love and hold them in your hand as they remember their loved one. We ask all of this in the name of our crucified and risen Savior who also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. Once again, good evening and welcome to worship. So good to worship with you tonight. Uh, just one announcement. Thank you to uh, Mrs. Miller for playing piano for us tonight and for uh, Lori for running the projector and our ushers for serving us. Um, you saw at the beginning, August 30th, we are planning on a celebration Sunday where uh, Principal Gustafson will be installed and... We have decided that we are going to install him in all four services. So Thursday night and then the three on Sunday because we're also inviting our brothers and sisters from Trinity to come to that installation. So we just want to make sure that everyone can uh, keep spread out and we can see him installed. God willing, if weather cooperates, we would like to have all three Sunday services outside that day. Um, the 1030 service will be followed by a luncheon, and that will be catered in. There's a sign-up sheet uh, both in your, uh, well, you can get a link to it in your weekly email, but there's also a physical hard copy sign-up on the placard in the narthex as well. So please sign up so that we can get a count on the number of people uh, that will be joining us and celebrating God by, by participating in the meal that day. Um, I don't have any other announcements here right now. May God bless you, and since there's no other services coming in, I'll stand in the narthex and we can go out this way and I'll kind of greet you on the way out. May God bless your evening and the rest of your week. <laughs>